Welcome back, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com, and we are joined on the line, finally, by Fred Fairbrass of Right Said Fred. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Pleasure, James. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. You know, we were just talking a little bit off mic, and, you know, things are things are tough all over, as the saying goes, and you kind of look outside, and it seems like everybody's getting a little amped up and getting a little getting yes. a little crazy. It, are, it, is, it is crazy times, and I think... As, as we were kind of talking, as I've been talking on my show, you know, dealing with some family emergency stuff, yep, exactly. thinking about that, you know, makes you want to makes you want to embrace the, you know, the love and the positivity. And you find when you put out that that's that's more of what's going to what's going to come to you. So so trying to make yes. it one day at a time. Yep, exactly. Yeah, there is a lot of anger out there, seeing it on seeing it on the social media every day. So I try and step what towards try and step out of the way of that. Because um, if I get if I get embroiled in that, then I, <laughs> it's not good for my karma. No, yeah. and yeah, you're right, man. Every, yeah, it's you can see it, and it's it's a just like the parties come in and out of favor. It does kind of seem like the anger switched from from one side of the aisle to the other. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And we saw it at Barclay, and you know, there's this weird intolerance on left and right. And personally, I think the left and right are the same. They just if they just went a bit further to the left or the right, they'd all be the one party, you know, uh-huh. they kind of meet each other in the middle. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's some, but there is some, yeah, the Trump thing and, and Trump obviously in the U S and Brexit over here is, uh-huh. well, it's, it's a poli- politics of division, isn't it? You know, divide and conquer. It is. And it's, it's working quite successfully right now. It is. Yes. It's working a treat. If I was one of the powers that uh, shouldn't be, mm-hmm. I'd be very happy. Yep. Yeah. You can look at it and go, wow, this this is going even better than, than they could have imagined. <laughs> Can't wait for Bilderberg. Be great. <laughs> oh, man. So just to kind of let everybody know, you're Fred of Right Said Fred. You're the guitar player, not In- your brother Richard, the singer. Yeah, Richard's the singer. I'm the, I'm the other one. <laughs> yeah, the other bloke. Yeah. Do, you, do you say you were the invisible one sometimes? <laughs> yes, I'm, but that's, you know, I'm used to it. It's been like that for a long time. And um, I had quite a sort of a baptism, baptism of fire when the band first broke, I did an autograph for this girl. And when I didn't write Richard, I wrote Fred. She said, oh, you're not Richard. She tore up the autograph and walked uh, off. And at, <laughs> at, at that point, I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> it's like, so this is what it's going to be like. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal. And, uh, yeah, she made no uh, moan. She did not mince her words. Oh, wow. So now, you guys have a brand new crowdfunded album called Exactly, and I want to talk about yes. that, and I actually played your new single a week or two ago on the morning show, Sweet Treats, Indeed, yep. and I want to talk about the album and the song and, and the video and, and, and charity and all that good stuff, yes. but, but first I, I just want to kind of get into how, <laughs> how did you and I come to be talking here right now? Um, I think because of James Corbett, because I was used to listen to, uh, well, I still do, um, the Corbett Report, and obviously you do New World, New, um, New World next week. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, New World next week. So I'm getting confused between that and your. There's a hashtag you use, which is. There's also good news next week. Good news. That's it. Good news <laughs> next week. That's right. Sorry. Um, yes, and so then I was listening to, to Corbett Report. Then I saw um, the um, the thing you do with James Corbett. So then I started checking you out, and then I've and I like your um, I like me the, the Morning Monarchy. I think it's good. Um, I like the, the, the bite size aspect of it. And um, then people can just follow up what they're interested in. It's good. So then let me, let me even back up from there. What, what brought you to Corbett Report? I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to drill in here is the, the explosion of alternative media. Yeah, well, I think, I'm trying to think back. I started reading lots of, you know, who, who killed JFK and all that sort of stuff back in the 80s. Mm. Um, and then I used to, I think, Late nineties, early two, early, early sort of noughties, I started listening to Alex Jones, yep. um, on and off. Then didn't really like being shouted at all the time, <laughs> so I thought I can only listen to Alex now and again. Um, although he does have some very good guests, but his rant kind of does my head in sometimes. Yeah, oh yeah. So, so then I started um, just putting some feelers out. So then I started listening to what else was there? Uh, Scott Horton. Okay, anti-war. Just, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, uh, Clyde Lewis. Hey, um, I, I know him. Yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> um, ground, ground Zero. Um, then I got on to, turned on to Richie Allen, who's a UK um, presenter. Uh-huh. Um, 
and that and then then what's the other ones I listen to um there's different there's a uh, ice radio occasionally but I listen to them because I don't agree with them so I like to just, just listen to them what they're saying but I don't really it's not really my thing so I just, then I started bouncing around and I decided listening to Ray McGovern and William Binney um reading their stuff reading you know, their interviews and then Robert David Steele and I, I just found it really interesting or particularly some of the ex security guys who have become whistleblowers and and you know p- putting their lives at risk if you like and certainly putting their pensions at risk mm. um, and um, I, I thought, yeah I, I just thought it was a good a good balance and it's not to say that all mainstream media is shit because it isn't but there but there is a an ongoing narrative that I think is quite damaging and I think it's good to get a balance from some people in the alternative media that said a lot of the alt media is also full of shit so you have to cherry pick there is that bluntness that you guys are known for sometimes yeah <laughs> just just because the mainstream media might be lying doesn't mean the alternative media is always 100% truth absolutely right yep yep exactly i mean i'm, I'm not going to start mentioning names but no, no. they 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 also there's a few out there that it's, it's the clickbait mentality, isn't it? You know. Yeah, because then there's you know there's so yeah. many platforms, and I you know I get frustrated trying to do the you know prep the morning show things, and I just want to find a fairly regular news clip just to kind of yeah. back up the story I'm telling, and all I find are these like you know the robot voice where they put. <laughs> yes, I know. I can't use that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's gotten pretty uh, to use an overused word now. It's gotten pretty swampy. <laughs> so it's tough to dig yes, through. Yes, it has. Yeah, I totally agree. With you. Also, it reminds me a little bit of the music industry because there are very few independent labels out there that aren't that aren't funded through the back door by major labels. Um, it, it's and it, and it strikes me with all, a lot of alternative media. There's a lot of platforms that are in fact just funded through the back door by maybe mainstream media or in, in you know self interest parties. Um, so I think you've got to tread carefully. Well, and that's uh, you know I, I always you know paid paid pretty close attention to the to the liner notes. I spent a lot of my time growing up in bookstores and record stores and yeah. video rental stores as well. And it was that early education because once you start to look at the logos and the names and some of the companies, you start to go, oh wait, yeah. And I saw that in in the in the early '90s. So when there was the the so called alternative music explosion, all the major labels signed up any you know half functioning bands. Yes, they did. And there was yeah. also this swell of, of these, oh, these new independent record labels. And if you just kind of scratch below the surface, you're like, they're a wholly owned subsidiary of some massive company, but they don't really advertise that fact. So that's, if- that's exactly right. I mean, that that, is a, that applies to a lot of um, a lot of independent labels. And we've sat down and had AMR and our meetings with them. And uh, yeah, they they you can tell you can tell the ones who are independent when you come face to fa- face to face. It's pretty clear who's getting funded and who isn't. Yep. And you can, you know, and once you have that little bit of knowledge, you can also use that when you're looking around and looking at music and and consuming and looking at media. You can kind of know that, oh, that's being pushed as indie, but I know that's a major label. And you may know that, you know, the bands might have been not really, you know, not been around for very long, that they seem to sort of be a formulated thing. They're going to, you know, it was funny when I I worked at the commercial radio station. um, Yep. (laughs) <laughs> I can say the band names. It's not like I'm going to ruin my reputation. And then, oh no, now the 1979 won't come on my show. Um, I was working at the at at the rock station at this radio company, and of course, as you know very well, when you go into radio stations, there's ten different stations around. That's the country. That's the news. That's the da da da. Yep. So they were kind of trying to push the 1979, their first record, and maybe that first, or at least the first one of the first singles I remember over here, Chocolate. No, okay. of course, a couple of years ago, and it didn't really go over well, and it didn't really work, and and then I noticed they sort of readjusted the way that they were promoting it and pushing it to radio because they okay. tried it to sort of like adult, you know, rock stations, which is the, yep. a triple A AAA station, which is what I worked for. It's called Adult Album Alternative, yep. so it's you know new alternative, but also Elvis Costello and classic alternative. It didn't fly there. So then right. their next move, I realized when I walked down the hall, it's like, ah, they're playing it on the pop station. They just kind of <laughs> yes, re- exactly. readjusted their, their promotional materials yes, and sold them as, you know, as cute young boys to, you know, to the pop station. And it's that yeah. kind of, 
Yes, it, it is. You can see that stuff behind the scenes, and that's a great, you know, that's a great education to hopefully be what we call media literate. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, when we first broke after uh, with, with, with I'm Too Sexy, we used to get phone calls from major retail outlets. Well, we didn't, but the label did. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, what, what number, what, what chart position do you want this week? They'd just ring us up and ask. <laughs> so we got, you know, and because we were hot at the time, so they just wanted to play ball. So we'd say, oh, let's, let, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's go in at, I don't know, let's go in at eight this week or something. And they'd go, okay. And so, so they would just, um, they would just ask us. So at the time, at the time, we thought it was fabulous, of course, but it's not. It's bullshit. Wow, know? that's uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's pretty manipulated. Yeah, just a tad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we, yeah, you learn that stuff early on, and um, we and also because we've always been independent. Uh, what what we found is that the minute things started to go a bit wrong on sort of after our second album, then. All the, ma all the major, um, a lot of major media pulls away from you because there's no, in they don't have any investment in you because you're not signed to a label that is bringing out the next Michael Jackson album or the next Springsteen album or whoever it is. So there's no leverage. So once it starts to go tits up, you are really on your own. And we found out that the, we found that the hard way, yeah. Mm. Damn. But hey, it is what it is. So, but also on yeah, on the upside, we own lots of our content, and we are very fortunate. So uh, ah, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to bitch about that. That's fantastic, and yeah, that that comes down to the situations of if you own your content or if you own your publisher. Yeah, absolutely right. When we, we when we get a sync request, um, not for all of our catalog, but for a large part of it, we can just e email the people the, the request back ourselves and just go so yeah, yay or nay. We don't have to go through labels and publishers, and that's definitely an upside for us, you know. Oh, absolutely, because then you don't maybe have someone else making the decisions for you to go. Oh, you you didn't want that in a Coca Cola commercial or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, having said that, I would let Coca Cola use it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. We have there, there's a there's, yeah, that mor morals can only go so far when you've got bills to pay. You know? This is true, my friend. We are talking to Fred Fairbrass of Right Said Fred. Finally, I think you and I, have, we've, we've kind of kicked back and forth, and I know we've sent emails, and then maybe months go by. It's like, hey, I, I thought we were going to do an interview, and we both have probably emailed each other that way. Yes, um, yes. It, 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 we, we've been a little bit slow on the, uh, on, on the uptake, but we're here now, so which is good. That's fantastic. So I think what's, what's been interesting, and again, to kind of go back to when I was working at that commercial radio station a couple years ago, Seeing it from the inside, and the fun part, of course, was being able to start to to do interviews myself. Because yes. you, you know, you basically you get all these interview pitches, and ninety percent of them are garbage. I'm not interested in. It's always like, do you want to talk to, you know, some TV star or something who's got their next thing to kind of promote? But I can also pick and choose and go, ooh, you know, so and so's got a new, you know, memoir book. So yep. I got to, um, you know, got to interview, do you know, dude from Anthrax and and several sure. different folks. I had a really interesting conversation, and it actually ended up getting kind of interrupted just due to radio work, and it, I never aired it at the station, because, you know, it's very, it's very fire and forget. If it's not ready to kind of cut and play it, you don't have a bunch of time to go back and edit everything, because there's just more coming on, and there's another day yes. you got to do. Yep, exactly. I, I, I get that, yep. So within this interview, and I've kind of mentioned it on my shows before, but I've never actually said the, the, the name. And again, I don't think anything's going to go bad if I go ahead and do it now. I was doing this interview, and in the moment and the time and what was going on, this is why I liked doing interviews, because I knew I wasn't asking the same questions everybody else was. Right. Ebola was the big uh, okay. was the big threat aganda going on at the moment. So I've, you know, I, I asked some of my some of my guests and of course you know they were always they were always taped phoners so it wasn't if if it went bad it wasn't ruined or anything um i <laughs> i asked joe perry of, okay of yep. aerosmith about yes. ebola i was like hey man you know there's a lot of hype in the news about ebola do you have any do you have any thoughts about that and he basically and he's very you know laconic not a lot of you know he's the quiet cool one next to the you know the rowdy front yes. man he said well i don't you know I don't know. Me and my family, we we only listen to the alternative media. Okay, cool. And that floored me, and I, you know, yeah. so I immediately start to go, well, you know, what do you mean? And he rattled off all these names, and and of course rattled off Corbett Report, and I was like, I I do New World next week, and it's crazy. I mean, it was crazy to basically 
talked to, you know, I'm supposed to be asking him about the memoir and about, you know, the wild rock and roll years. And then we're talking about the alternative media and corporate culture. It's great. That that is good. Yeah, it it, it was good to hear as well. Yeah, Yeah, it is. So you never know. You never know. Absolutely right. You never know. That's great. So here we are now in 2017, and Right Said Fred has a brand new crowdfunded album. Was it actually, was it 100%? Or was it Pledge Music or, or something else? It was, it, was, it was Pledge Music okay. for the, for, we, did, we used Pledge to do lots of bespoke stuff, you know, signings and, and uh, merch and stuff. Okay. But we actually, we just paid for the album ourselves. Um, and Pledge was uh, partly, part funded the album. But we weren't relying on Pledge. We just thought we'd get on and do it and see what Pledge delivers. It's been all right. It's been pretty good. Um, and uh, and also for us, the album, you know, we, we'd go out and doing festivals, doing Camp Festival and Cornbree and a bunch of other mm. European, European stuff. So really the album is like a, you know, it's like a promo tool, really. Um, I, I doubt very much whether we'll chart with the single or the album. Um, we don't have the promo budget to, to, or, you know, I don't think we have the, the traction to do that but as long as it puts up our value at, 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 at the sharp end of playing live and performing yeah. that then the, then the album doing, doing its job yeah absolutely yeah so it's funny i guess i'm kind of coming at this from going hey welcome to the, welcome to the alternative media but actually <laughs> you've been there for a long long time longer than yes. us is like you said once once the you know the big the big fame starts to move on. Of course, all the other hangers on are all going to kind of move away. So you've moved into this realm a long time ago. So you were yes. maybe actually, I bet it was probably harder back then. And now that the tools have kind of presented themselves and the technology has expanded, it is much easier to do a lot of this ourselves. Yes, it is. I mean, when we, um, although we, my brother and I used to session during the 80s. So I played guitar with Bob Dylan for a short time. Yeah. Richard played da- bass with David Bowie. We both played for Mick Jagger. And it was great. It was a great experience, very privileged. But it's not your own thing. So uh, and we always liked being a bit quirky and odd. So in, 19, in 1990, we wrote and recorded Sexy. And then we started going around the labels with it. And nobody would touch it. I mean, just n- not even a sniff. You know, no huh. one like said, oh, maybe a remix would work. I mean, they just hated it. So we thought, well, we think this is a hit record. So what we had to do back then was just not try and have, not try and get it signed, but get it on the radio. And we had a lucky break through the girl, a girl manager we knew, and she got it onto the biggest station in the UK um, at breakfast time. And the minute, the minute the public heard it, it just went insane. I mean, literally, it was overnight. They they, they played it once. <laughs> all the phone lines went insane and they still had to play it again. And and it just, uh-huh. I mean, I'd like to say that we had some sort of brilliant marketing plan, but it, the record worked itself. It, it just went mad overnight. It was friggin' insane. That's so- and, and, and fortunate, you know, very, we, we were very lucky. Yeah, that's, that's so awesome. Yeah, I love even just kind of picturing that because you, I, I'm sure it didn't take long kind of in your guts to go, oh, oh, oh my God, this is, this is on. Yes, yeah, we, we we felt it, we felt it pretty quickly because European markets started picking up picking up the track immediately. Um, but it was when we saw it going top forty in the U.S. on import, we thought, well, if this is charting on import, we might have a shot. So we did a licensing deal with Charisma, I think, at the time, mm. and then it just went insane. I mean, it just. Um, I think we were top ten like a month later, and then number one about a month after that, and uh, and it was it was great, but also a little bit. The trouble with your first track, I mean, that was the first track, right? So Fred released. The trouble when the track is that big, the track is bigger than the band, and that's a branding issue. So that it does cause problems. So, you know, we're very lucky to have that track, but it in some territories it caused problems because you go to those territories and they say, and you're known for this song. And even though you've had other hits there, one song is so dominant. It's it's um, it's quite a it's quite a thing, quite a balancing act. You have to sort of perform to yeah, make it work. That's true. You know, I, I've I've some of my some of my favorite bands, smaller bands that have that have been doing it for a long time. There's one of my favorite bands out of Canada called Sloan, and they've oh, now yeah. love those guys. They you know they've now been together. Jeez, they're almost been 25 years. And they have often said, and I've, you know, as the years have gone by, I've been able to kind of make friends with them and interview them, and they'll they'll always kind of recognize me at the shows and things. Which is that's 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 a whole that's a whole part and parcel of this, you know. Yes, our, our band could be your life. They're not untouchable rock gods on some giant stage. Uh-huh. This is we're all people here. 
<laughs> yes. But they have often said that because they got signed to DGC alongside Beck and all the other, you know, Geffen big alternative bands in the 90s, like Nirvana and the, and the rest of them. Yeah, sure. Sloan always kind of said maybe we were lucky that they didn't have kind of a big hit that would have really kind of reaffected things. And they were able to sort of, they did two albums on a major and then they got dumped and then they pretty much kind of rebuilt themselves and have done it themselves ever since then, made their own label and of course have, yeah. you know, stateside, stateside distro through Yep Rock and some other things. And Okay. Yeah. So it's that, yeah. you know, we're, it's, it's a, it is a new era and I think it becomes that much more important as I realize it to go support those artists that you like. Yeah, I think I think the independent thing is also I think independent people people think independent music is of a particular genre. Of course, it's not. You we're, we're we're an independent pop band. There are independent rock bands and reggae bands and electronica and everything. But the word indie conjures up a certain sort of shoegazing <laughs> image. But of course, of course, it's not that. It can be many things, you know. Um, and for us, um, although sex has been very dominant, we've also We've also been really lucky, like in the UK and Japan and South America, most of Europe, to have sort of half a dozen top ten hits. So we've been very fortunate. So we have to, um, you know, I, 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 mo a lot of my friends still play in pubs and earn, you know, fifty dollars a night if they're lucky. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, sort of hint at resenting the success of Sexy because I don't. And when we perform it, we now do a seven minute version. And it's just great. <laughs> we go into this mad electronica thing at the end, and people love it, you know. That's it. I mean, people do yeah. love it, and that's, I mean, it's such, I mean, you're, you're, you're so blessed to sort of have have a forever thing. Yeah, we are. We are very lucky. Yeah. And I, I don't get bands who say, oh, we don't play that song anymore. I don't get that. I mean, what are you doing? You know, that's, I think, I, I think once the song is really big, uh, you, know, you I mean, the artist owns it. Well, the art, it belongs to the artist sort of uh, emotionally. But in reality, the public own it. And it's in the, it's in the public domain. So to, to try and disown it seems pretty disingenuous to me. I think uh, if, you, if you're known, like, um, uh, we, we've done a lot, few shows around the same um, cities as, um, at the same time, rather, as Van, Van Morrison. And he's got a real reputation for not playing some of his hits. And I think that's, if I went, to, well, I have seen, I did go to see Van Morrison, and he didn't play Moondance. Mm. And I was thinking, what the fuck is that about? You know, what are you doing, man? I've come here to hear your big hits, and he wouldn't do them. And I thought, and he was great, and he's a wonderful writer. But I just thought that was weird for an artist not to play its biggest hits. Mm. So the new record is called, exactly, it is out now, and the lead single is called Sweet Treats. I had fun playing that on the morning show a few weeks ago. So uh, the, the video... Yes. You you guys had something where you did uh, you you were able to kind of give the budget away to charity. I remember seeing you guys yes. do this. Kind of followed it on Twitter a little bit. Yes, we did. Well, we, we were having the usual budget negotiations. So we were we, uh, our budget was about um, two and a half thousand pounds. Let's say three and a half thousand dollars, something like that. So then it started creeping up and up, and we would yeah. You know, so, and then after the fourth fifth uh, video budget meeting, we're at ten thousand dollars. We just thought yeah. This is insane. So what we decided to do is to go back to like a midway point. So we went back to about three and a half thousand pounds, so five thousand dollars, let's say, ah. and um, we decided to spend about thirty percent of that on the video, and then just take the rest of the budget and uh, and give it to a homeless charity called Crisis. So we spoke to them; they were very receptive. So we did a cheap ass video, pulled lots of favors. <laughs> And then gave about three and a half thousand dollars to charity. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I mean, I just think I'm, I also now MTV doesn't play videos anymore. Who, who, apart from YouTube, where do these videos ever get seen? So, <laughs> you know, they turn into a bit of a vanity project. And and I just thought, you know, I mean, really, does it matter? So we just went down to we went to a local uh, a pub not far from where we live. Uh, we went there on a Saturday night. We bought people drinks. We all got a bit drunk. We bought people pizza. And everybody jumped around. That's so, it. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> That's <laughs> the way to do fun. it. <laughs> yeah, it was fun, man. It was good. That's so great. Man, again, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know it's starting, to get, starting to get later there over in the UK. It's still here in the middle of a very rainy afternoon here in Portland over in the States. 
As we've been talking to Fred Fairbrass of Right Said Fred, and I'd like to think this this won't be the last time you and I talk. No, we should talk again. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Any uh, any other any other closing thoughts, closing words? Um, well, um, no, we're, we're looking forward to going out on the road. Um, um, we are sort of in the middle of Trump and Brexit mania, so I think this. I think we're living in very interesting times in terms of uh, politics. And I have no idea. I mean, there's lots of talk online about whether whether Trump is a is is the neocons guy or whether he surprised everybody, and and no one you know just caught everybody off guard. I actually I, I haven't got a clue, but I but I do enjoy I enjoy I enjoy watching the uh, the, the spectacular as it as as it un, un, unfolds. It's quite interesting. It is. It is. It's, yeah. May you. Yeah. That's the curse. That's the blessing. May you live in interesting times. Absolutely right. Yeah. And in Europe, it's very interesting as well. There's a huge amount of division and uh, and um, sort of frustration going on. I, I think that frustration anger has been there all the time. But for some reason, Trump and Brexit have acted like some sort of conduit, and it's just kicked off. You know. It really has. And you know, and there's maybe a little bit of something like. So, I mean, really, for here in the States, there was eight years of, yeah, you can't really criticize the president because there's all these other little issues and you might be a racist if you say anything bad. And now it's sort of all bets are off and all that pent up <laughs> anger is just blowing up. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to admit from a <clears throat> yeah, from someone living outside the U.S. looking at Obama's administration, <laughs> I don't understand the adulation he, he he gets, I don't really get it because his foreign policy policy was a friggin' disaster. So um, from a outside, of, from a non-American point of view, I don't really understand his uh, his sort of um, fated kind of um, image. But hey, you know, may, maybe if I was a, an American, I'd see it different. I don't know. But um, certainly from a, um, from a European point of view, the endless aggravation towards um, Russia, the Middle East. NATO continually sharpening its sword is a, is a nightmare. It is. Yeah. It is. Well, that's where we're going to have to kind of keep working together and work on the positive and not give, right. in, not give in to the darkness and keep reaching out to people. And that's, that's you know, as we all go through our all go through our struggles and things, going through family emergencies and everybody's got all of their other, you know, all their other issues. I think the more we get together, it's going to be way better than, than dividing. Positivity is always going to beat negativity. Absolutely right. If we if there was lots of harmony and no one and no division, um, the powers that be would have a night would have an absolute nightmare because because they'd have no that we, we we wouldn't be fighting amongst ourselves all the time. We fight amongst ourselves. We are so easy to reign and control. It's ridiculous. Those are great closing words, Fred Fairbrass of Right Said Fred. I appreciate you so very much for for being a media monarchy fan, for getting involved, for speaking your mind, for not being quiet. This is awesome, Fred. Thank you so much for coming on Media Monarchy. Pleasure, James. It's been, 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 been my pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, man. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.